Okay, so so I'm thinking about giving uh, my third lecture. I thought I would do it a little different from uh, what we've done before. And so the surprises are not going to be so much surprises for the experts. They're really things that surprised me as I learned about them uh, in about 20 or 25 years of doing density functional theory. And in fact, uh, so I'm going to just do a few, uh, but also these these sort of surprises I think are sort of instructive, right? They they give you a sense of how things develop. Uh, so the first one, uh, so some of them are they're all sort of simple. Uh, there's no complicated many-body theory or density matrix functional or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and actually, and one uh, very good student asked me about one of these questions earlier today, or a similar type question. Uh, so the first one I'll do is is a quote from uh, my friend Steve White, who's at UC Irvine, uh, and he was the guy who invented something called density matrix renormalization group, and we've been working together for about six months. Uh, from, uh, sort of using DMRG as a very fast quantum solver and studying things about density functional theory. And after six to nine months of working together, he comes out with this statement. Not a formula. It's an algorithm. And he said this was a huge surprise to him, and it took him about nine months to realize that, even though we've been talking about DFT for, for ages, right? And uh, uh, because he always got the impression that the exchange correlation energy is a formula, because of course that's all you ever see if you go along to meetings and people are doing calculations. They take one formula or another, right? So let's see what this algorithm is, okay? And I just want to sort of go through it very quickly. So, so the idea of a density function is you give me any density and I, you should be able to, what is the rule that gives you this number, right? And it's just a simple exercise. So, so somebody gives you some horrible made up density, right? It has to have certain simple properties and integrate to the right number of particles and, and so forth. And somebody gives you, draws a density and says, okay, give me the exchange correlation energy. So how, do you, how, how could you get that if you had uh, infinite computational power, which essentially we did with the DMRG? Uh, so here's N of R. And so step one is, I guess, uh, V external of R. I make some reasonable guess for uh, a one-body potential uh, whose ground state density is that, right? Uh, and that would be my V0. And solve the many-body Schrodinger equation. Out will pop in, in some ground state density, not the right ground state density. But then I compare this to this. I look at the difference. And I have some simple algorithm that says, OK, we're where this is too high, I make this lower, or vice versa, uh, in order to improve my guess. So then I guess again. So we'll call that P1. And I solve. And I get N1. And then I iterate this many times until the difference between the density that comes out and the density that I look for uh, stops changing, right? So it finally gets to N of R. So I keep solving different many-body problems, but once I'm done with that, then my V is now the one, the external potential for that density. That's the map. And uh, we know it's unique from the homework cone too. Okay. You're in your smoothie view of presentability here, right? Uh, I am. Then uh, I take a, uh, once I've done that, I repeat the procedure. 
with my electron-electron repulsion set to zero. And in fact, in a criminal waste of time, we actually did the DMRG with the electron-electron interaction set to zero. We do exactly the same thing again. Sort of dot, 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 dot. Uh, and but what will pop out? Instead of the, this is the V external of R, what, what comes out of that procedure? Yes, yes, what was that? Yes. Vs, right. That is the definition of the cone sham potential, right? So I should write them like that. Uh, the non the, uh, the potential of non-interacting electrons, right? And then, uh, if I want the, well, if I want the exchange correlation potential, for example, I write Vxc of n of r is equal to, I'll do it right around Vs uh, minus V r and minus uh, the r. And that one we know. Uh, and also, once I have this guy, in solving this, right, I also have the cone sham orbitals that I found when I solved the non-interacting problem uh, and found potential that gave the right density. So from these guys, I can construct TS, my non-interacting kinetic energy. I just take the sum of the squares of the group of the orbitals. So once I have TS, then Exc of n will be the ground state energy of n, which I know from here, and I, this thing stopped iterating, and I subtract off the Ts, the external piece, and the hard piece, which I get from the Poisson equation. So the point of this is to show you what a density functional is conceptually, which is it's an algorithm. One, you have to be able to say if somebody gives you a random density, what you would do in order to get this guy. And this, and this, and this is what the exchange correlation energy actually is. That is its definition. Because you said that B to zero and you get the external as the same as Cohn-Shank potential. Yes. So, so this is yes. This is sorry. I don't bother saying external. This is this guy here, right? Yes. Yes. But you see, everything that we got came from the initial density. Now, this is not a simple formula, right? It's a recipe. And that's what the exchange correlation energy actually is. It's simply a recipe. And notice also it's a very, very expensive recipe. In order to do this procedure, we had to solve the many-body problem many, many times. We had to we make guesses at this until we found the right one. So we had to solve the many-body problem more times. I mean, why not just solve the thing, right? Because the question I asked was, what is the exchange correlation energy toward arbitrary density, right? And I don't know if it's the solution to some many problem. In the first step, mm -hmm. you solve for the external, you don't know, and the, it appears the kinetic energy part yet, or the exchange correlation That's right. I'm going to solve, solve the Schrodinger equation, the many body Schrodinger equation. So I'm going to guess the potential and solve the full many-body problem and pull out the ground state density. You don't have a many-body grid function? No. Well, I'll find it. I, I'm solving the Schrodinger equation. Right? No. Uh, so I'm saying I have infinite computational power. This is the concepts, right? This is... Right? So in fact, of course, we did this with DMRG. Oh, and so uh, for this, uh, for the purposes of this lecture only, right, I'm going to use some numbers, B133 and B143. So B is me, and these are numbers of papers on, on, on my website, right? Whatever it is, I don't know, DFT of UCI.edu. 
So if you go find me on the web, find the publications and look up those numbers, uh, a, there you'll see calculations where we are the only people ever to be stupid enough to actually, we were the first people to solve the cone sham equations with the exact exchange correlation function. Now there's a real subtlety here, which is when we do an approximate calculation, we approximate this formula directly, right? And then we can just differentiate it and we can solve our cone sham equations. Uh, we don't want this density dependence or any of these density dependence. It's only this difference that is used in the cone sham calculation not uh, the actual energy as a function of the density itself. That isn't enough information in a sense you want precisely this part. And that's the part that gets approximated when you do an approximation. Uh, okay. Was that a surprise? Sort of. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, now, unfortunately, my second surprise uh, I'm still going to do it a little bit, but John ruined it uh, when he said, so the second surprise is that PBE right, has two derivations. But I want to emphasize this a little bit more, right? And he explained what they were, right? Uh, which is one was the uh, real space cutoff. of the gradient expansion of the XC hole. And that's a sort of complicated numerical procedure. And then uh, the other one was seven exact conditions. Now, as far as I can tell from sort of tracing the literature, right, this paper with this nice title, John's title, GGA Made Simple, right, uh, really popularized the idea that basically you could take any seven exact conditions and make up a new version of PBE, right? The important thing is the two derivations. So this real space cutoff has no sort of empirical inputs other than the normalization of the whole and various exact conditions. But if you look at the paper, and I took a look at it, uh, uh, just before we did this, if, if you look at the where PBE lands compared to the real space cutoff, actually these are the numerical points, they're on top of each other. This is for the exchange enhancement factor that John showed, at least up to uh, S equals 3. And the reason you believe uh, that the seven exact conditions are relevant, right, is because it gives the same answer as the numerical uh, construction. This real space cut off of the hole. Uh, so what you do, uh, you have uh, sort of simple formulas, right? Plus the exact conditions gives you the, the PBE uh, enhancement factor, right? Which, but because it agrees with the real space cut off, that's why you believe the uh, the uh, the result. Uh, but also, unfortunately, it sort of popularized the idea that you could take any real space cut off. And, and you know, uh, I would say, you know, uh, is there any expert in this room who hasn't published a version of PBE? Uh, RPBE, Rev PBE, XPBE, PBE Sol, you know, uh, we've all done it. Uh, and now, so. Now, John said in the scan, case of SCAN, right, he's, well, he's relying on more exact conditions and the appropriate norms, right? Uh, because I think it would be extremely difficult to come up with the, uh, with, with the analogous exchange correlation hole at the level of the meta GGA. Uh, and also, uh, it's, we're going to see that certain aspects of the GGA are not right, uh, which are really to do with the energy density. It gives very accurate energies, but not the energy densities do not act, sort of correspond with uh, 
uh, the exact energy densities of the system. Okay. Uh, oh, I seem to have lost the blackboard here. Okay. Let me come back here. Okay, so anyway, so for a lot of people, uh, lots and lots of people know about the seven exact conditions. Very few people seem to have actually read the paper and, and read about the real space cut off construction. And there's a paper that I forgot to look up. On, on well, There's a couple of papers on my website that go through the, uh, the real space construction, which is like a collection of about 20 papers of John's. Uh, over the previous 20 years, putting together how you do that real space puzzle. That probably wasn't much of a surprise. We had gradient expansion. So this is you know the where you, you take the formulas for a slowly varying gas. But then they violate all sorts of exact conditions, so you restore the exact conditions with this very crude cutoff procedure, but it defines a GGA. And back in those days, we used to call it the GGA. Uh, little did we know. Uh, okay. A third surprise, which I don't know if you will find this a surprise. I, when I thought about it for a while, uh, I find this very surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so, especially since you're sort of young and starting, right, there may be just enough time to catch you before you just believe all this DFT stuff, right? So when I was, when I was a child, uh, I learned a few things. One, many, many body problems are hard. I don't know if other people have noticed that. Quantum many body problems are harder. And then fermion quantum many body problems are hardest. Okay. Yet somehow mysteriously with dumb little formulas that you can write basically on the back of an envelope, stupid little ones like PVE or the Yang bar, and you can really write these formulas down, write explicitly, and you can code them up. And you can get very accurate results for a vast number of systems, sufficiently accurate, maybe that you know, whatever we said, it's our 30,000 people a year use them. Now, how can that be, right? I have literally seen hundreds of books on the quantum anybody problem that tell me that it's a really, really difficult problem to solve. Uh, so how can it be that those, those little formulas give you uh, such good, uh, such usefully accurate results? And now scan, scan is a little longer, the formula, but, um, and so we've written on one page. And uh, the answer that I like, so many people have different answers to this problem. I happen to believe this is, in a sense, the answer. Uh, it is in a theorem that even Simon proved. So the leap Simon theorem, and it's a PRL from 1973. So Elliot Lieb is one of the world's top mathematical physicists and Barry Simon is essentially the god of functional analysis. Uh, and they proved the theorem. It, it's very funny if you look at this uh, this Swiss red letter, you know, it's four pages, that's all you're allowed, right? The four pages are sort of a description of the theorem. There's the statement of the theorem, and there's a little discussion of how it is to be proved. And there's about 800 pages in other uh, journals which have the proof of the leap Simon theorem, right? No chance. Of so these guys have very strict rules. Uh, they take, they start from the Schrodinger equation, and they prove things rigorously, right? Uh, absolutely rigorously. 
And what do they prove? They prove that proved that uh, Thomas Fermi theory, the Thomas Fermi approximation uh, becomes relatively exact. In this limit that I mentioned earlier, as z goes to infinity, uh, for n equals to z, and you must also scale all the bond coordinates. Let's say r j goes to r j over z to the one third. So you squeeze up your bonds as well. And this is a this is only true for atoms, molecules, and solids, as in everything, right? So when I first start, got into DFT, right, I kind of knew about the lean Simon theorem and I didn't care at all because we don't do Thomas Fermi theory. Thomas Fermi theory is not accurate enough, right? Uh, but it turns out that the analogous statement, which I'm not going to spend my life trying to prove at the same level as Steve and Simon, is that becomes relatively exact in the leave Simon limit. So what this is saying is that I take any system, any system at all, and as I increase z, keeping the number of particles fixed, uh, sorry, e e keeping the number equal to z, and I shrink the bonds a little bit, uh, the local density approximation will become exact. And sure enough, if you look at the errors, say the exchange energy of atoms, as you go up in the period, this is non-relativistic, as you go up in the periodic table, uh, the LDA error goes down. And it's only 1% by the time you get to 88, c so equals 88, whichever one that is. Of course, we don't have a periodic table. Uh, now, and, and there's a, a long discussion of this in B173, which is uh, a JCP from last year, a Journal of Chemical Physics article from last year, where we tried to explain what's going on. And the important point here is that we actually sort of explain what happens for correlation alone, that even correlation, LDA correlation, eventually becomes uh, relatively exact, but at a very, very large z. Well, what does this tell you? This tells you that LDA is a universal limit of everything. And notice, by the way, that this statement never mentions the uniform gas. Being a universal limit is much more important than being exact for a uniform system. Every system becomes relatively uniform in this limit. What happens is, as you put more and more electrons together, and you have to do it in exactly the right way, the way of thinking about this for exchange is that the Fermi wavelength is getting shorter and shorter and eventually it becomes very short on the length scale that the potential is varying on. And those are the conditions under which local approximations become accurate. And as you squeeze it more and more it becomes exact. And this is the first term in an asymptotic expansion and that's why it tends to give reasonable results for almost everything, right? It overmines for sure, but uh, it always sort of does it in the same kind of way. And so it turns out this explains this explains why it's uh, sort of reasonably accurate, let's say, but very reliable, right? LDA errors tend to be extremely systematic. You sort of can always figure out which time they have, or almost always. 
And then you can understand that GGAs and all the things that follow uh, are attempts to get the leading corrections. Now, two things that have come from this. Well, so let's say part of the motivation for PPE Sol, but uh, uh, John and Adrian and I were on, uh, is, is uh, one of the conditions is from this asymptotic analysis. And then also there's a paper that not so many people know about. You can derive the beta in the parameter in the Becket 88 uh, exchange functional, and this is the 118 using uh, this analysis. What you discover is that Becket 88 almost exactly gets the leading correction for atoms numerically right. That's not a coincidence. If you look at what Becket wrote at the time, he ex his first before he actually did Becket 88, he actually used the asymptotic analysis to get the number. Uh, or to try to get the number, and then afterwards he uh, fitted uh, so that he would get a, a rougher number, but that would be more accurate at lower values of C. And by the way, so, so the, the, the series, in very simple cases, you can show that it's incredibly accurate once you have two terms. So the first term is LDA, and we don't have any case where we can really write down except for very simple model systems where we can write down the second term. But when you add the second term in, it's more accurate than any of our density functions. Uh, and one other thing, I guess, before I go on, is, let's see. Uh, so one thing, way you can understand, you understand the Coulson-Fisher point. Remember that we discussed about when uh, LDA, uh, when you break uh, the spin symmetry in an LDA or R3 block or a GGA calculation, as you stretch the H2, uh, the two hydrogens apart, you can understand the coulson fisher point is that this is the uh, breakdown of this asymptotic expansion. So it's where uh, you can sort of see very clearly uh, this asymptote, so I said H2 looks very like helium at equilibrium bond distance, but then as you pull it apart, you can show uh, that right at the coulson fisher point is where the expansion fails entirely, and this is one, we said, this is one way of thinking of what strong correlation is. So this is why density, our standard density functionals, so if you understand it this way, what it tells you is for this systems that the DFT tends to work on, that LDA gives you a reasonable answer on, and your GGAs will do a better job, and your scan might do a better job still, or a hybrid, but then they will all fail uh, as you uh, go towards these localized uh, fluctuation problems. And you can see then when the, when the two atoms are far apart, then each of them is dominated by a separate expansion for the separate atoms rather than for the combined system. Now in this case, I got to mention there's about 20 papers on my website. So we've been studying this for 11 years. And there's two ways in which we study it. One is we look at very simple, often one-dimensional systems and look at the kinetic energy functional just to try to understand the mathematical structure of this. And it's beyond, basically, the mathematics that people currently have. Uh, so there's a whole while then, and poor Attila, our uh, chief organizer there, wasted pretty much his entire PhD, right, uh, on this topic, uh, but did solve the one well, now we have two cases, but the first case where we would actually calculate these corrections. Uh, particle in a box. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and then the other branch is things where we 
we don't do derivation so much as we use insight uh, into how the functionals are working to, to you know, tell us about things in the real world. Uh, okay. Uh, so yes, we had. I had to make this. Love you, and then I'll. Uh, so this is. So when I said that, you know, this is why we cheat uh, by subtracting the energies uh, of the individual atoms from the bond bound molecule, right? Uh, that, that's what I mean by that cheating. But it's not cheating if you understand it this way. Because your expansion will fa fails as you stretch the bonds, but it's perfectly okay for the individual atoms. And John uh, had this quote, uh, which was, "Getting the right answer for the right reasons at the right cost." And I like the quote, except my preferred version is getting the right answer at the right cost. I don't care about reasons. <laughs> Uh, in the sense that, in the sense that, often we get the right answer for what look like wrong reasons, but it turns out that it's really that we just don't understand, right? So many people, for example, when the Beck 88 functional was done, and there was this fitting, right, and this parameter, and people complain about the fitting, right? So it was 18 years before we could derive that parameter in the Beck 88 functional. So it was good that he went ahead and published it and, I don't know, tens of thousands of people got to use that functional and we didn't wait for some, uh, a bunch of theorists to derive the parameter. The parameter was right and now we can sort of prove that it's right. But it's better not to wait the 18 years. Okay. How does uh, hybrid GPS fit into this mentality? Uh, it doesn't really. Uh, well, hybrids do uh, a little bit, uh, but all the other stuff is, is sort of too complicated. Uh, you know, we don't understand very well how this thing is working. So we're sort of stuck on the LDA to GGA piece at the moment. Uh, I think that's the best way to put that in, in terms of this asymptotic framework. In, your, in view of what you have found in your work compared to what Deep uh, and Simon called, you know, when the Thomas Morris theory has none of the LDA exchange correlation. Yes. So uh, would that mean that in that we mean that exchange correlation is irrelevant? Yes. But my statement is that this thing becomes the exchange. This is a much stronger statement. Exchange correlation becomes relatively exact. So that statement means you are much, much more accurate in a cone channel calculation with LDA exchange correlation than in a Thomas Fermi calculation. Right? It's a much more powerful statement and much less proven, right? Uh, but, but a much, much stronger statement, right? So this is this is this is a way of thinking about this. This is like sort of doing leap Simon about four orders down in the expansion, right? It's much, much stronger. But I think one has to be careful you stated the, the relative sense, because the sentiment error goes down. Yes. Total error goes to infinity. No. Uh, yes. Well, even for this guy, it will, yes. 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 So uh, the point is, when you're adding some other term, like at the uh, Dirac exchange, the Thomas Berman with Dirac exchange. Yes. Is improvement? What happens at the end of the day? Well, well, well that, that helps, yeah. but you also have to put in the gradient correction for the kinetic energy, because that's at the same order. Right. Right? But then, yes, you, then you get one more order of accuracy by doing that. Yes, through this expansion. But this is far more accurate. Right? Doing a cone jam calculation with LDA exchange uh, is, is, is much more accurate. Okay, how's my time, John? Uh, you have about seven minutes before Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to extend uh, today's session by uh, 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I okay, so the accuracy, so I've got to tell you the story, right? Accuracy of semi local approximations. So this is just one long story coming up here. 
Uh, so, there was a meeting about 20 years ago or so in Paris, the DFT meeting. Remember Paris and the nice place in Paris? Uh, and at that time, I think it was actually PW91 was the GGA, uh, maybe 1995. And we have a good friend, Cyrus Umergaard, who got the, an exact density for, for the helium atom. And so, so well, let's see. Uh, if we plot, let's plot the exchange potential for the helium atom. And so, so we can do that procedure. It's exactly the, sort of the procedure that I outlined in the first surprise, right, uh, that Cyrus did. And here is going like minus 1 over R. So this is Vx of R. This is 1.7 roughly. Uh, and then I'll plot the LDA potential, right, which goes like this roughly. So this is LDA. And then I'm going to put in PBE, which looks very similar except at the nucleus. So this is PBE. And it was PW91 back in those days, but it looks essentially the same. So this is the exact exchange potential going like minus 1 over R. These are our density functionals. Now, the exact energy, uh, the energies, <coughs> the exchange energy is minus 1.025 Hartree's, LSD is minus 0 0.883, and PBE is minus 1.013. You can see, right, so LDA has its typical underestimate of about 10% for helium. And that goes down as Z goes up, as I said. But PBE is much more accurate, right? So a, it's, for this problem, the, this is the exchange energy, right? Uh, it's a much more accurate result. But now let's look at these potentials. Here's the exact exchange potential, and neither LDA nor PBE look anything like it, right? They're wrong in all sorts of ways. So they're way too shallow. They don't have this minus 1 over R tail. Uh, and then PBE looks even worse than LDA. It has a divergence at the nucleus. So this is a bit of a surprise that the better, what's going on, the better density functional is giving what looks like a much worse potential. And even worse, if you look at the correlation energy, the correlation potential, as Cyrus pointed out, somewhat impolitely, I don't know if anybody remembers this, he pointed out that the PBE correlation potential looks almost like the exact one if you multiply it by minus one. <laughs> it looks upside down, right? How can I forget that? He called it upside down. <laughs> he called it upside down. Okay. So I puzzled about this, and I think, uh, well, I, uh, I don't know if it was during that meeting or a later meeting, uh, I thought about it, and it turned out, well, I knew a theorem that John had taught me, right? And I'll just write the, it's called the burial theorem. So this is one of these ditzy little uh, CFT things, right? that John and Mal have proven in their scaling paper. Uh, and they did for correlation. They were the first ones to write correlation. Uh, I think it was known for exchange. It was a very simple relation. Was it known for exchange? It was known for exchange. Okay. Uh, it was a very simple relation between the potential and the energy. So how can this be? How can that, this terrible looking potential? And the potentials really are terrible in your approximate semi-local functionals, uh, since the potential determines the energy, right? So what you can do, what we did at that time, uh, after thinking about it for a while, you can define this as an energy density. Just call this guy an energy density here, right? And you can plot them. 
And what you discover, if you plot this guy, the radio guy, uh, here's LDA, here's the exact um, PBE, looks like that. And it's almost perfect, PBE. So you see with the LDA, the energy density is about 10% smaller than the exact one everywhere, the PBE. Uh, almost exactly lands right on top of that. So what happens? How could this be? And this be so wrong, right? So it turns out if you plot the density on the same scale, it lives out to about here. And you see there's a factor of the density here, right? And there's also this 4 pi r squared, so that the area under this curve is exactly the energy. And you see you have this r dot del vx. So we know that there's a roughly a constant shift of these guys relative to the exact one uh, when you study the derivative discontinuity. Well, a constant shift has no effect. Only the gradient of the potential matters. Uh, and then uh, you have this r dot del thing, and it turns out that tells you exactly where uh, it's when the, the gradients match that these two cross each other. Uh, but that's how uh, you can get this much better energy. And if we do correlation, uh, the correlation looks even, even more spectacular if I put in correlation here. Remember, that's that 42 millihertz. Uh, LSD uh, is a huge overestimate of the correlation, and PBE gets it under very nicely under control. And that's the upside down correlation potential of PBE gives you this huge improvement in the correlation energy. And so what this teaches you is that this looks terrible, right? But in fact, the important features as far as the energy are concerned are all working just fine. And they, uh, uh, they give you these better numbers. OK, so given that, then you can think about uh, The next thing that, that becomes interesting, let's say, is the, so, so good energy functionals have bad looking potentials and they still have good densities. Now how come the density in a density in a cone sham calculation turns out to be very accurate, typically? The reason is the density lives sort of in this region and in this region, this shift, this is roughly a constant shift relative to the exact one. If I shift my potential by a constant, the orbitals don't care. The constant in the potential has no effect on the shape of the orbitals. You shift it by a constant, the eigenvalues all move up, uh, but the orbitals are exactly the same. So in this region here, where the potentials are different for, by roughly a constant, except in the, near the nucleus, which doesn't matter because of the 4 pi r squared, and you get a very accurate density. So the cone sham orbitals, uh, at least in the region where most of the density lives, are very accurate normally. Okay, but your uh, your potentials are definitely bad. So that's how you still get good densities. So then this led to this question of the ambiguity, ambiguity of the energy densities. which is also a bit of a puzzle. So if you write down any formula for the exchange correlation energy, you think, well, I have some uh, definition of the exchange correlation energy density, but I can add to it any function. That's okay, I'm gonna invoke the Yang uh, gross okay. curvature. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if this guy integrates to zero, then this is also an energy density, right? So the energy densities are not uniquely defined. And I can give you a beautiful example of that, which is, I'm gonna write the LDA.
I've done an integration by parts here. And this is a correct energy density for the LDA. So this is N of R. And you can prove it. But if you stare at it too long, your head will hurt. Because I bet if you try to evaluate that for on a uniform electron gas, you'll get zero. Right? Because there is no gradient. The gradients are zero. Well, that's a little puzzle you can wonder about. But this is a perfectly correct energy density for uh, LDA. And you can read. Go find the papers on the website. B45 uh, is one of them. Uh, I think it has these kinds of formulas. Uh, OK. Now, in the process of doing this study, these energy densities, uh, you find out lots of interesting things. But one of them is that the choice of exchange correlation energy density right, is, has this ambiguity in it. And different functionals have been constructed different ways. And so they can differ in what their choice of the exchange correlation energy density was. The only physically meaningful uh, thing uh, that comes out is the integrated quantity. And it turns out, so LDA, it's ex the normal exchange correlation energy, is a good approximation in a certain sense to the exchange correlation energy uh, of your system extracted from the whole. And then we did PBE and we extracted it from the whole, but in the process of doing so, we did an integration by parts. And we lost the information about what the choice of the exchange correlation energy density was. Uh, what does that mean for a periodic system? Uh, it means it's pretty tricky uh, to apply, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so this is you know this is sort of defined for a finite system. Now you can do periodic systems, but you have to do a few tricks, right? Uh, but since you can prove this, this is identical to the regular LDA for any finite system, then and then take the limit. Is it energy density for a system? Uh, like, kind of say, this is the energy per unit cell. I'm not sure. That pops out of every calculation. <laughs> no, 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 but the point is that this is, per, you know, uh, if I take the system as sort of large and finite and take it to infinity, I get the same answer. The point is that will, this will produce terms on the surface. Uh, but it will integrate to the exact same quantity. Let me give you a simpler example. We, I think, already have this, that the kinetic energy density, some people like to have this guy. And that's the one that's used uh, in, the, uh, in the meta GGA. But then there's also this guy. And these are both perfectly valid choices, or any linear combination of them is a perfectly valid choice for the kinetic energy density of your, of, of your kinetic energy. But they're different. You plot them out, they look very different, right? And, and how do you get from one to the other? You do an integration by parts. So stuff gets put on the surface, which is why it gets tricky for periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and in the process of doing this, studying this question, we just happened to mention right at the very end of one of these papers that this problem will become particularly severe if you try to do a hybrid locally. So if you take a GGA energy density and you do some mixing with the exact exchange energy density, you would have this problem that the GGA energy density is defined differently from the one you extract from the exact exchange hole. And all we did was mention this 
Uh, but it turned out, as John pointed out to me much later, uh, we were the first people to write down the idea of a local hybrid functional. So, and, and so that you know, paper has gotten cited quite a bit. And this is an interesting example where we didn't actually do anything. Right? We didn't do any real work, but we got a bunch of citations. Uh, uh, whereas usually, of course, it's the other way around. Uh, uh, and so uh, on several levels, the PBE exchange correlation energy density is sort of, you, know, you can see it. It, 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 it doesn't match point-wise the real one. And that's one of the problems with GDAs. And I believe the scanned energy density that's in there uh, looks a bit better. OK, for my last surprise, uh, well, I got to do this one, right? So, and this to me was the biggest surprise, is we learn in kindergarten, and we learned, I think, on the first day, except Mel forgot to say it, right? Well, so you have this, this F, right? F of N. in the homework home term. And we're going to approximate it by approximating exchange correlation, or Thomas earlier approximates the whole thing, doesn't matter. So we make some approximation, F tilde of n, right? But then we use the approximation in two ways. We're, also, we're going to evaluate the energy with this guy, and we're also going to evaluate, find the density by solving the Euler equation. So when we do an approximation and we solve our cone sham equations, what we do is we find the approximate density, right? It's not going to be the exact density. So y hats are the uh, approximate densities. So if we analyze the error in any density functional calculation, you can see that it comes out to have two pieces. So if I look at the error, it's the approximate energy functional on the approximate density minus the exact energy on the exact density. And we're going to write it as two different pieces. And we call this the density driven error. And this is the functional driven error. So the functional driven error is the error that your functional makes evaluated on the exact density. So that's the error, the energy error in your approximation. And this is going to be uh, in a cone sham calculation will be the error made in your exchange correlation on the exact density. And this guy is always less than zero by the variational principle. So it turns out when you just analyze things this way, you discover lots of things. Like, for example, Thomas Fermi theory uh, down to ED is about four times bigger than delta EM, which tells you that Thomas Fermi theory has for decades gotten a bad rap. Because the mistake it makes is not the mistake in the energy is mostly dominated by the mistake in the density. And in fact, you could test your Thomas Fermi theory and it will do much better if you test it on exact, uh, on exact densities. And then you will also see that cone sham, one of the reasons cone sham was such a big step forward is that normally in cone sham, the functional error is much bigger than the density driven error. And in fact, we use this almost all the time, especially when we're developing new functionals, because we always use the old orbitals. Because you don't want to do it self-consistently at first because you've got to figure out the functional derivative. So you take some old orbitals like LDA orbitals and you evaluate your new functional on the old orbitals. 
Well, what you're doing is you're assuming that the change in the density from one set of orbitals to the other is so small compared to the error in the energy that uh, you can ignore it. And that's true almost all the time, most of the time, I'd say. But it isn't true always. So the surprise turns out to be that a huge number of self-interaction errors or delocalization errors uh, that White was talking about are actually density driven. Uh, many of the ones and so there's a review on, on the website with Adam oh, B174 I'm just going to list all the properties we found and some of these uh, White Owl had pointed out in the uh, original articles on the delocalization error. So, uh, anions. Ions and radicals in solution. Barrier heights of pretty much all reactions that we found so far. Uh, and dissociation curves of heteronuclear diatomics and probably sort of all molecules apart from uh, symmetric ones. So not the H2 plus, not the H2 that White uh, talked about. So all of these cases People will refer to the errors in their semi-local approximations as self-interaction errors. But it turns out, in every case here, you can improve the density. The error is coming from the error in the semi-local approximation for the self-consistent density. And in all these cases, you can analyze them and you can show that the self-consistent density goes wrong. And you can do a trivial fix, which is if you evaluate uh, DFT on the Hartree-Fock density. So this is not using Hartree-Fock to get the energy. You use Hartree-Fock to get the density and then evaluate it on that. And there's a script by collaborators at Yonsei uh, in Seoul. Uh, I have scripts on the website that tell you in 10 minutes how to take almost any quantum chemistry code and do this. Right? You just solve the Hartree-Fock equations and then at the very end you evaluate your density functional. And in every case here, you get much better answers. Much better answers. So for electron affinities, the errors are half the errors that people get for ionization potentials. You do better with the semi-local functionals for electron affinities as long as you have a decent density. Whereas everybody says, you know, well, I can't do anions, little anions, because because it's it's unbound, and it's true. You do it self-consistently, and it is unbound. Uh, but but Hartree-Fock densities are bound, and you evaluate on them, and you get really good electron affinities. So you say that Hartree-Fock density are better than complementary densities? Uh, for it, uh, for for these the, the what we call these abnormal, but I mean they're very common. Uh, so, in these cases, the Hartree-Fock density, well, we can argue about what we mean by a better density, uh, but essentially, the, using, using the Hartree-Fock density with a semi-local functional gives you a much better answer. Who asked that? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't quite imply that the Hartree-Fock density is in any sense better. What it says is that the errors that the self-consistency functional that we're making are sort of compensated by the Hartree Fock. And the reason is it's sort of self-interaction free, or in White House language, it localizes charges sort of correctly. And these are all cases where the self-consistent thing does it the opposite way badly. Uh, so what I know what the surprise here is A, nobody had done this two lines of algebra as far as I could tell uh, before. And B, all this comes from this nasty remark that Cyrus made in Paris about 20, 
25 years ago, right? Studying. Uh, so that's the thing I wanted to convey, right? So these little, little things, and I could just do those things because I had Cyrus's own Juan Monte Carlo data for the density to find out how come the potentials could be so bad, the energies were so good, and here you have 25 years later, well, you know, lots and lots of people are using this now. I mean, even barrier heights are much better uh, with the heart of densities. And of course, people had noticed this before, but nobody had figured out why it happens and when it happens. You've got to know when it happens, because in a normal system, if you do Hartree-Fock and do the DFT on top of it, you'll get a slightly worse answer, but only a tiny bit worse, but you get it worse. But in the abnormal cases, it's much better. Okay, Thank I'm you. done. So you ran a bit over, but I can take <laughs> five minutes for questions okay. um, and comments. Mm -hmm. So um, when you talked about these two valid expressions for the system of energy. Yeah, um, yeah, the, yes, the two that I've written down. Does it not sort of contradict the principle that for a given approximation, there's one unique Cohen-Sham system of equations because there's two different kinetic energies that you can evaluate? So, the, so those were kinetic energy densities, right? Okay. So they integrate to the exact same number. Okay. And my point is that I could, some people in one field tend to use one, and in another field they tend to use the other. They're both correct. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. Uh, but the trouble is, if I write down some approximation, i got to tell you which one I'm approximating, right? Or else you don't know. Back. There is the orbital string um, DFT. Yes. Which is, we didn't discuss the to, if I understand correctly, it's closer in nature to the common string integration. Right. And that the arrows the, in, in it closer to the common string arrows, which come many from the density. In the same way. Uh, yes. So, so one thing is you have to watch out for in that game is that you know people will often t test their kinetic energy functionals on the exact density or compound density, right? And their errors will be much smaller than if usually than if they did it self consistently. So the proper test is to do it self consistently, and then you begin to see why it's so hard to get an orbital free functional. Because all the quantum oscillations and all these details that the cone sham basically gives you for free, no you know, no sort of local or semi-local thing or two-point thing can really get all the shell structure. Uh, and, and you know, and missing that means you make a substantial error. So that's part of one way of thinking about why it's so hard to do uh, orbital free DFT. Uh, that's right. And and you know, but well, you need to get all sorts of quantum effects into this density, which you get by the cone sham because you're solving a quantum system, not interacting, but it's a quantum system. So you get really far, far more accurate densities in the cone charm calculation. And that's the thing that makes orbital free very hard. Okay, Hardy and then Lee <coughs> um, Are you a student? Yes. We're all students here. <laughs> <laughs> About the uh, mean Simon. Mm -hmm. Is that valid for periodic systems as well? All these proofs, oh, so uh, their proof is, uh, actually, hold on, their proof is for is only for sort of finite systems, but I'm trying to remember if it's been proven. I mean, I, I, I'm sure the result is true for periodic systems. Uh, um, but I don't know. I you know I can't remember if it's covered in the 800 pages. Slightly contest your your logic. That you said so. This is a universal limit. Yes. Yes. So, um, why is this an explanation that the 
ODA works or gives these advantages for essentially all the systems. Yes. So, so it's the dominant term in this asymptotic expansion as z goes to infinity, right? And roughly speaking, our, our real systems have z, well, let me call it n, the number of electrons, one or two. Because if you think the, the thing that really matters is the couple of electrons that form a chemical bond. It doesn't matter if the rest of the core of, of your atoms and things, that doesn't really contribute. So, so and I didn't have time to do it here, but I do the simple example of the non-interacting atoms, and you can see, I mean, and was it Dyson who talked about the power of asymptotic expansions, and you can see how when you add even the second term, you get much more accurate results, and then the third term, you get insanely accurate results. So this asymptotic expansion is controlling sort of what goes on, and if you look at the LDA results, you see that that's exactly what dominant terms in asymptotic expansions tend to do. So this is then the crucial of the statement. It's not so much the deep side of the limit, that may be very far away yes. from the real world. And, and so a really important point, especially since you and Mike like to chat so much, is li yang par correlation, right, is it has, is it has a terrible feature from the physics point of view, which is that it doesn't give you the right answer for the uniform gas, right? It doesn't matter. So it turns out for correlation alone, right, the, uh, the, the number of electrons of which the uniform uh, correlation energy of the uniform gas, because of the LDA becomes relatively exact, is something of the order of 10 to the 9. So in this case, it's a logarithmic sort of convergence, and therefore uh, the numbers are astronomical, and exactly what you just said applies. So cor that's and that's a big part of why chemists for correlation energies, if you look at the functionals that people have, the exchange ones almost always get the uniform gas right, but the correlation ones don't. And this is why correlation by itself is not dominated by this thing. But exchange correlation together certainly are. And on the archive somewhere we have a thing where we actually do this asymptotically corrected GGA which gets the correlation right for atoms as z goes to infinity as well as the exchange. And then you see this beautiful cancellation of the errors between the two, uh, presumably because the shell structure is having the same effect. So, you you mentioned this more or less constant shift in the relevant region between LDA and the exact yes. potential. Just what I mentioned, this is not coincidental. So, yes. for a functional that doesn't have the correct asymptotic decay, you can choose, it turns out from ensemble considerations, that the natural choice for, for the constant that you want to get is not an asymptotic constant in zero, but the asymptotic constant that would obey the ionization potential theorem. And if you do that, then actually the potential goes down and it makes the exact or right. very close to yes. the energy. Absolutely, yeah, no, of course it's not a coincidence. And these well, 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 but this is actually part of the asymptotic thing as well, because you're sort of getting halfway between the n and the n plus one particle system. And so the smooth curve goes halfway in between, and that juices the, the shift. Give oh, priority sorry. to the younger students yes. over the elder yes. ones. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one question. For, if I was, say, trying to find an energy difference between a crystal that I've compressed very close to, so I'm trying to get a pressure. So. Yes. Um, that error due to the choice of function. This, this thing here? Be, yeah, yeah, this is what you were trying to have. One of them. Yes. Is, uh, so, kind of the correct density, but just the energy that might be. Yes, right. Does that tend to be systematic? Like, for example, could I get a better pressure if I did the self consistent calculation with PV and then I use something like meta GGA using the density from that to get just the energy for that density? So, so. That would be a cheating way to. Uh, yeah, so this analysis, right, I will uh, compare an approximate calculation to the exact one, not one approximation to another. 
So that's that. So it doesn't give you insight into something like what you're just saying. Uh, so so, and the point is that both the exact one satisfies the exact variational principle, the approximate one satisfies the variational principle for the approximation, and it uses all the, that information to come up with all these sort of results. Uh, so it does. So uh, so so the statement would be that if you knew, and I'll give you an example of it, if you knew. Uh, but uh, if you have access to a better density, right, and you knew, and we give ways of how you can tell whether, guess whether or not you have a density driven error, so with those two things you can then go ahead and try this out and see if you get a better energy, right. Uh, so, so one thing that we haven't done, because my collaborators in this were, it's all chemistry and we just do molecules and things. So one very interesting project would be if you look at LDA SIC for solids, you can ask the question, if you just take the SIC orbitals and feed them in, for example, into a GGA, uh, will you get you know, substantial, you know, substantially better energies for things that have strong self-interaction error? Now, we just haven't done that calculation yet, but it's quite possible that that would be a way of self-interaction correcting GGAs and so forth for strongly correlated solids. So uh, you mentioned that for these uh, specific abnormal cases, if you measure the DFP functionals on the hydrogen work density, you mm -hmm. get better results. Yes. But what's the, the logic behind that? How they came up with this? Uh, if you calculate on this? Uh, so so the, the reason is, so you, and you, you, can, you can see it very clearly uh, the paradigm case of this that have been known for 30 years is H minus. So Rose and Shore, right, in 1972, studied H minus with that year's version of LDA, uh, and they could show that this unbinding of the uh, of the extra electron, and they show very clearly that a third of an electron takes off when you try to do it self consistently. Okay. So what we did, and there's a FISREP letter on it from, I don't know, 2012 or 2013. What we do is we take two electrons and we put them, uh, in, we look at the difference between helium and H minus. We take the Z in the atom and go from two to one. And sure enough, you see uh, that it goes nuts uh, when, when you hit this critical value, 1.28, and you start losing an electron. And we break down the error into density driven and functional driven. And you see just a total, it's like it's a, a sharp point where suddenly the density driven error, which was tiny, starts getting huge and the functional error is perfectly smooth and it's getting smaller as you go down to H minus, which is why we get a much better electron affinity. Uh, now in that case, it's a little special at H minus the Hartree Fock density uh, it's sufficiently strongly sort of correlated. The hydrogen felt density is not a good approximation to the quantum Monte Carlo, so you get even better results if you put in a quantum Monte Carlo density uh, for that. But the basic effect is that the hydrogen Fock remains bound in these cases, and it localizes charges. And as Whitehouse was pointing out, its error is in the opposite direction to the density functional case. So where the abnormal systems are the ones where the, the convexity of the curve, that shape, is causing problems, and then by doing Hartree Falk, you're definitely fixing that problem because as it goes the opposite way around. Uh, but I understand you're correct that all problems which you point out there, about this driving errors, it's mainly the two self-interaction errors. So, so, so these are all I think on on White House list. Uh, but he has three or four more that we can't, so like H2, stretch H2 and H2 plus, which we can't do this way. Uh, but people tend to call all of these things self-interaction errors. So is this basically true self-interaction error, right? So, so that's... The basic problem is self-interaction error. Self-interaction error in the self-consistent density rather than in the energy, yes. The energy has no problem once you give it a good density in these cases. The energies are very good. So if I have density function, mm -hmm. which design such that um, such that with 
get rid of this self interaction error. Then, so, then, then, and then we tested one so like. Uh, I run so consistently. Yeah. Uh, uh, that should be okay, right? Absolutely, yeah. This, I mean, this is for fixing. Well, I mean, it uh, depends on the accuracy of the thing, but I mean, if it gives you a better density. Take the 06 MCY. They don't. They are self-interaction free, and they don't solve any of the problems. Oh, oh well. Okay, it depends on what you mean by self-interaction free, right? Because uh, the people use this as a sort of grab bag. There are lots of different effects that people tend to call self-interaction. It's better to use White Arrow's method of localization and delocalization. Uh, so yeah, so just because you could create a functional that doesn't have an error for one electron, that doesn't yes. mean that you've yeah, so I was using the self-interaction thing in this more general sense. Yes, or you get this straight line curves. That, then, we don't have a problem. I have a function which cancel out uh, this localization error in Coulomb, in half hatching. And then this problem should, I should get rid of this problem, right? So, well, well, I mean, it would depend on exactly what the functional is and what it's doing, yeah. But in general, not. No, no. It, it, uh, RPA would be a good example, right? You have, you have pull on and you have 100% change. Yes. But you don't have enormous uh, self you know, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. No. So it depends, that's what I'm saying, it depends on how good your functional is. Uh, yeah. So we have run way over. Mel, you had your hand up. Do you want to say something? Or? Well, uh, yeah, well, uh, of course, you said Younger had priority, right? Yeah. That means that everyone else in this room. What about the work of Dillis Sitter in, 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 in Germany? Remember, he, he direct, more directly goes using the constraint search. Yes, so... And, and, and so that's a... Remember, maybe not exactly... Right, they were using... Uh, Quantum Monte Carlo. Yeah, uh, David Stephanie. Right. So, so, so they were using it, I think, to get in fact the, the energy density directly uh, with the Quantum Monte Carlo. So no, so we didn't do the sort of constrained search in the direct way. So we have this DMRG thing, right? So we don't have a. So, so the first part that I said, no, I go around and around. I know the difference. Yes. But I was wondering what was the thought of uh, I remember discussing it with them, and I'm not quite sure that it really implements the constrained search the way as directly. Yes, as they would like it to be. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Let's thank you, Yeah.